This conference is being held in conjunction with the NEDS Democracy Award Ceremony this evening that will honor four groups working on human rights in North Korea, whose leaders are with us this morning. And they are Sungju Lee and Bum, Bum Jin Park from the Citizens Alliance, which is really the group that really first put the issue of human rights in North Korea on the uh, international agenda. And then there's Ji Sung Ho and Shi Woo Choi from NOW, which is one of the leading defector NGOs in, um, in uh, working on human rights in North Korea. And then there's Hubert Youngwon Lee and Sayek Oh from the Transitional Justice Working Group, which is preparing for a future process of transitional justice in North Korea. And finally, we have Kwang Bek Lee and Sang Young Lee from the Unification Media which has broken the information blockade against the North Korean people that has been imposed by Pyongyang. As I think everyone knows and understands when we scheduled this conference and the award ceremony this evening, we had no idea that these events would be so timely, uh, taking place as they are the day after yesterday's summit. NED's objectives in supporting these, grant these and other grantees working to advance human rights in North Korea remained the same the day after the Singapore summit as they were before, though indeed they've taken on a new importance in today's altered political context. These objectives are to end the isolation of the people of North Korea and to connect them with the outside world, to empower them with information and knowledge about democracy and the rule of law, to make policymakers, journalists, and the broad public in the world at large aware of their terrible suffering, which continues undiminished to this day, and to begin to lay the foundation for the process of transitional justice and accountability for the human rights crimes that have been committed by the North Korean regime, a process that will surely come, will surely come at some point in the future. We need to be very clear that there can be no, peace, no real peace on the Korean Peninsula so long as North Korea remains a closed totalitarian state. Before we get started, I want to thank all the donors who have supported this conference and tonight's Democracy Award ceremony. Their names will be in the printed program for this evening's event. For those of you who are on social media, we have our Twitter handle and hashtag for the event on your printed uh, agenda here as well as on the screen in the back. And please follow at Ned Democracy and use at Dem Award to join the conversation on Twitter. And let me take this opportunity also to ask you, if you haven't done so already, to silence your cell phones. It's now my great pleasure to, in, to invite Andrew Card to make welcoming remarks. He, of course, was the White House Chief of Staff to President George W. Bush and has been, among many other things, the president of Franklin Pierce University in New Hampshire and the U.S. Secretary of Transportation. He's one of the most respected people in American public life, and we're honored that he's the chairman of the NED board. Andy. Well, thank you, Carl. That was a very generous introduction. I am not worthy, but Senator Markey is, and we're glad to be with him. I welcome you to the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, I'm the new chair of NED. All of you should be a little afraid. <laughs> but I'm here to follow through on what President Reagan did when he helped to create NED. And I'm excited to share this experience of being at this particular conference with you because we've got a lot to learn. Um, we have some wonderful panelists who are going to educate us about a country that is in the news this week. And this is an important discussion for us to have because we represent the conscience of democracy. And there are many who are fighting for that con conscience around the world, and that's what we'll be doing. 
but in the long term, we know that we want to address all problems around the world, and I do compliment our president for uh, giving us an aspirational document that also tries to address a particular challenge of uh, making sure that a nuclear North Korea and a response to that it would be something that would not cause damage to the world and to humanity. President Reagan appealed to uh, the world and to British lawmakers in a very famous speech at Westminster. It was on June 8, 1982. And I remember that. Uh, there aren't many of us in the room who are alive to remember it, but I remember that speech. And basically that speech called for us to work to create the infrastructure for democracy around the world. And that was literally a quote that President Reagan used. He wanted to make sure that there was a way to build an infrastructure to support democracy around the world. And that led to the creation of the National Endowment for Democracy. So we foster the development of an infrastructure to support democracy, which means labor unions, freedom of the press, the right to assemble, the right to express your views, to stand up and build governments that are for the people and of the people and by the people rather than just run by oligarchs or autocracies or fiefdoms, and that's what we try to do. As President Reagan said, our military strength is a prerequisite for peace. But let it be clear, we maintain the strength in the hope it will never be used. For the ultimate determinant in the struggle that now goes on around the world will not be bombs and rockets, but a test of wills and ideas, a trial of spiritual resolve and the values we hold, the beliefs we cherish, the ideals to which we are dedicated. That is the National Endowment for Democracy, and that's who you are as people who are involved in helping to spread democracy. The organization uh, that are represented here today will receive NED's highest honors, the Democracy Award. Now, that event will take place in the U.S. Capitol, and we are excited about that happening later today. It will be emblematic of President Reagan and Ned's mission to fight the ideological battle by supporting people who are dedicated to making democratic progress even in the world's most closed society. We understand that peaceful resolution of conflict, political stability, and economic prosperity are byproducts of pluralism. The rule of law, respect to human rights is important and a re robust civil society and independent media holds governments accountable, and we want to make sure that everyone understands that. Supporting democracy, investing in democratic leaders and infrastructure is both a moral and a political imperative for the United States, and it is not a partisan cause. It is truly all partisan cause. Not bipartisan, all partisan cause. NED's awardees, uh, South Korean activists and North Korean defectors, are working daily on behalf of the people of North Korea to bring them news from the outside and to share their news from inside the hermit kingdom, to rescue North Korean defectors who bravely crossed the border and to support them in building a new life, to document crimes against humanity, and to teach the world about the gross violations of rights that are human rights, but not practiced in North Korea. So I'm pleased to welcome you to the endowment, and I congratulate those of you who will be award winners for the work that you do. I would point out that Senator Sam Brownback, we had hoped was gonna be able to join us. He was not able to join us today. Uh, we do have uh, the pleasure to have a prominent leader in the Senate with us, but I just want you to know that this is not a partisan event, it is a bipartisan event, and Sam Brownback uh, sends his greetings as well to you. Uh, he was a Republican senator. I'm going to introduce a Democrat senator. Senator Ed Markey has been a friend of mine, and maybe he won't want to call me a friend, but we were served together for a long time in the Massachusetts legislature. I have known him since the 
late 1960s, early 1970s, and that seems like a long time ago to most of you. It was just yesterday to me and to Ed. And he has been a remarkable leader. I remember when he first won the respect of voters statewide in Massachusetts. It was because uh, he had been punished as an outspoken member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. And he stood up to the powers that served in the leadership of the Massachusetts House, and it took great courage to do it. That courage resulted in him running for Congress in a crowded field where it was very difficult for a very young Ed Markey to stand out. But he did stand up. And because he stood up and expressed himself, he earned the respect of voters, not just in the congressional district that he was running in, but voters statewide. There was a famous baseball player, and yes, I'm a Red Sox fan. Uh, there was a baseball player by the name of Bill Lee. Some call him Spaceman. Bill Lee respected Ed Markey. And I'll never forget the political ad that I saw Ed Markey run. And Ed only ran one ad because he didn't have any money. <laughs> but this was an ad of Bill Lee walking down a dark corridor in the Massachusetts State House to a camera. And when he came into view, Bill Lee was wearing his baseball hat with the B on it. And he came to a desk because Ed Markey's desk had been removed from the committee he served on and had been put in a corridor because he crossed with the leadership of the Massachusetts House. And when Bill Lee got to that desk and he looked right into the camera, he said, the political bosses can tell Ed Markey where to sit, and he pointed to the desk, but they can't tell him where to stand. Ed Markey has stood for what he believes is right for a long time. And that is why he has served for over 42 years in the United States Congress, both as a congressman and now as a senator from Massachusetts. He's been the co-sponsor of a lot of bipartisan legislation. Yes, he's a partisan Democrat, but he fights for that which he thinks is right, and he invites others to stand with him because he has a track record of standing with them when it's necessary. So with, Corey, with Senator uh, Gary Gardner, Cory Gardner, he has done an awful lot. He sponsored the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, ARIA, uh, which seeks to provide a policy framework to enhance U.S. leadership in the Indo-Pacific region by promoting the rules-based international order peaceful denuclearization de of the North Korean Peninsula, of North Korea and the, South, and the Korean Peninsula, and promoting human rights and respect for democratic values. Senator Markey, I am proud to call you a friend and a colleague. I too like your wife, and she has been a remarkable presence for you and made you much better, even though you were pretty good to start with. <laughs> And I'm thrilled that you'd be here for the National Endowment for Democracy, and I look forward to your remarks. So thank you, Senator Markey. Please come up and take the microphone. So thank you, um, Andy, and we thank all of you who are here, um, whose goal <coughs> is to um, advanced democracy um, on a bipartisan, nonpartisan, multi-partisan basis, as Andy was saying. And uh, we congratulate all of the winners uh, of these well-deserved awards. Um, Andy and I um, <clears throat> do go back um, to uh, the beginning of recorded political time. Uh, for one brief shining moment, they elected children to the Massachusetts State Legislature. 
And <clears throat> Andy and I were elected as state representatives in the great and general court as the Massachusetts legislature is called. Now, Barney Frank and I were elected with Andy. And we were in Massachusetts. And so we meet Andy. We evaluate Andy's superior political skills. And then we conclude, what a shame. He's a Republican in Massachusetts. He has no political future. Nothing will ever come of this guy. He's trapped inside of Massachusetts. But we recognize his superior political skills. Uh, and Andy <coughs> actually, with Phil Johnson, our good friend, who became the chairman of the Democratic State Party in Massachusetts, he created a commission to root out corruption inside of state government. Then Andy became secretary of transportation for George Herbert Walker Bush, and then chief of staff for the president of the United States, George W. Bush. And so um, Andy's career has been something that has made us very proud to have known him since we were just children, just young boys starting out. As I can look out here, many of you will be as well as you look back at these young people who are, who are you are meeting, who are dedicating their lives to trying to make the world a better place. And so uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, for those great words, um, and uh, Andy and I have careers that <clears throat> are dependent upon not actually getting along with the establishment when we were younger uh, and defying predictions, and, uh, and that's what we hope is now going to happen in the Korean Peninsula. Um, <clears throat> so I was able um, uh, today to be invited uh, to work uh, uh, with you, to speak to you uh, about the bipartisan fashion in which um, in almost every corner of the globe under incredibly difficult circumstances to promote democratic institutions, freedom, and human rights uh, that the National Endowment of Democracy seeks to advance every day. And it steadfastly supports organizations devoted <clears throat> to improving the lives of North Koreans. It is critical that we all try to help bring about change in that country so the people can prosper. But to make that vision a reality, we also must deal with the North Korean regime's dangerous and destabilizing activities. Today, as we look back at the summit <clears throat> between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, I remain concerned that the rhetorical and written outcomes of the meeting fall short of what is needed to launch a credible diplomatic process towards peace. Let me be clear. After the heated rhetoric from both sides, the President's turn towards engagement was, by all accounts, a very welcome development. After all, there is no military solution to the North Korean nuclear crisis. <clears throat> and I know that many of us were concerned that the President was backing himself into a corner that could only lead to military action. That is why I have long advocated for direct engagement, and the President's outreach is notable no matter how unorthodox. But if we are to succeed in reaching a durable solution to the North Korea crisis, we must view the summit as the beginning of a long process. And while we must, of course, focus on the marquee threats of North Korea's nuclear ballistic missile and other weapons programs, we cannot forget the importance of addressing the human rights situation in North Korea as well. So direct bilateral engagement between governments must augment the great work of the organization that is represented here today. The horrific human rights record of the North Korean regime is inextricably linked to Pyongyang's weapons programs, which depend on forced labor 
and the resources that would be better spent alleviating the suffering of the North Korean people. Yet, the agreement signed yesterday does little to address the threats and challenges we face or to begin to tackle the brutal oppression North Korea has conducted against its own people for decades. This is troubling as the threats from North Korea are significant. Unlike in other countries with nuclear programs, North Korea already possesses thermonuclear warheads and the ballistic missiles to deliver them. It has shorter range missiles that cast a dark shadow over our allies, South Korea and Japan. And as the UN Commission of Inquiry documented in its landmark report, the North Korean regime has systematically violated the human rights of its people, committing crimes against humanity. But these threats cannot be solved with force. The human cost would simply be too great. <clears throat> so I have long called for a diplomatic approach to the crisis. When I met with President Trump last October, when he asked me to have lunch with him, with uh, Cory Gardner, the chairman of the Asia Subcommittee, I made the case to the president that direct and unconditional discussions were the only way to turn our pressure into progress. I will be the first to admit, however, that yesterday's vague statement, devoid of details, was not the launch pad I had envisioned. The President did not address basic definitional issues that must be clarified to begin making meaningful progress. First, we still don't know yet what, quote, complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula means. For example, Kim Jong-un can easily interpret that language to mean that he will only relinquish his nuclear weapons once the United States does the same. After all, history suggests that North Korea interprets the term Korean Peninsula to include U.S. nuclear weapons capable of striking North Korea no matter where they are stationed. By contrast, previous agreements were much more stringent. As you are all aware, the 1992 Joint Declaration between North and South Korea, for example, included conditions such as, quote, and this is with President uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Quote, South and North Korea shall not test, manufacture, produce, receive, possess, store, deploy, or use nuclear weapons. And South and North Korea shall not possess nuclear reprocessing and uranium enrichment facilities. Unfortunately, neither commitment appears in this latest agreement nor did it commit North Korea to improving the human rights of its people. Second, what timeline will be acceptable to all parties? Denuclearization, however, defined, simply cannot be solved overnight. And all parties appear to have differing expectations regarding the timeline for sanctions relief. What milestones must North Korea first reach. After all, we have not been applying pressure to North Korea for the sake of pressure. Our sanctions are meant not only to degrade North Korea's ability to threaten the United States and the region with its weapons, but also to compel North Korea to engage in meaningful negotiations that lead to peaceful denuclearization. Additionally, the international community including the United States, has imposed human rights-related sanctions which should remain in place until there is genuine improvement in the human rights situation on the ground in North Korea. As it appears that the administration was unable to convince North Korea to adopt tougher, more detailed commitments, I hope that it is clear to the President that it is too early to remove the pressure. North Korea has not yet felt the economic pressure necessary to compel it to accept our definition of denuclearization 
and the detailed commitments that come with it. And relaxing human rights-related sanctions absent meaningful progress by the regime would remove important levers and could lead to greater repression. Third, assuming we can reach agreement on the definition of denuclearization and we can agree how to sequence tangible concessions with sanctions relief, how will we conduct a credible verification regime? Verifying the North Korea uh, 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 concessions uh, uh, will not actually be an easy thing to do. So we have to ensure that we have verified that they have truly abandoned their weapons program uh, and that will become an unprecedented challenge for our country. North Korea must relinquish or destroy the warheads themselves, as well as the facilities it uses to manufacture weapons-grade nuclear materials and related components. And we must ensure that the regime has not stashed extra warheads deep in secluded bunkers or mountain hideaways safe from the prying eyes of weapons inspectors. And similarly, the lack of access in North Korea means verifying real improvement in the human rights situation will be equally difficult to achieve. The honorees here today and the panelists who will speak after me have dedicated their time, their talent, and much of their lives to improving the lives of ordinary North Koreans. I know that many here will talk about the work of the four honoree organizations, and so I won't delve into too much detail, but I want to note how the work of these organizations can help address the North Korean human rights situation. One, provide real, uncensored information to North Koreans about the nature of the North Korean regime so that the people can hold their leaders accountable. The Unification Media Group is doing just this by way of shortwave radio. These open broadcasts provide North Koreans uncensored news about North Korea, South Korea, and the rest of the world. Number two, prepare North Koreans to reintegrate into the global community. After living in a closed society, many North Koreans struggle to determine their own destinies. Now, Action in Unity for Human Rights is bringing together North Korean youth defectors with South Korean counterparts to help prepare North Koreans to successfully integrate into South Korean society. And number three, continue to raise awareness about the suffering of the North Korean people. Citizens Alliance for North Korean Human Rights is here today because of the significant role it has played in raising awareness of the human rights situation in North Korea, including efforts that led to the UN Commission of Inquiry and the Transitional Justice Working Group builds on the incredible work of the COI by documenting and mapping the crimes against humanity committed by the North Korean regime. These groups are up against a formidable foe in the Kim regime. And as we try to mitigate the threats from North Korea, we must be wary of the Kim family playbook, which Kim Jong-un pulled out again during yesterday's summit. True to form, Kim ran the same plays as his father and his grandfather. One, front load rewards, delay concessions. Kim appear, be, appears to have secured a commitment from the United States to curtail joint military exercises and the advocacy of China's foreign ministry in supporting the loosening of sanctions on North Korea, all despite the lack of any tangible evidence of denuclearization. And two, use sleight of hand to make irrelevant actions seem meaningful by supposedly demolishing its nuclear test site and a missile engine test stand, North Korea is claiming that it has not made real progress despite not destroying a single warhead or missile 
And all of this takes place under the shroud of ambiguity. The Trump-Kim agreement is so vague that it imposes no clear requirements on North Korea. For every potential concession, we must ask ourselves whether it is truly an irreversible step towards denuclearization and reciprocate appropriately. We must also keep the pressure focused on areas such as human rights where there has been little or no meaningful progress. Most of us agree on what North Korea needs to do. The trick is figuring out how to get there. We must stay focused on the security situation, but not at the expense of the human rights agenda. So to successfully navigate the hazards, we must follow these principles. Number one, do not sell out our allies. We must not allow North Korea to believe that the alliance framework which has served as the foundation for regional peace and security is anything other than unshakable. Unfortunately, South Korea seemed to be caught off guard by President Trump's announcement on military exercises. And as the honorees today demonstrate, few understand the challenges faced by average North Koreans better than the South Korean organizations working closely with defective populations. Two, do not prematurely release the pressure valve. China, North Korea's chief enabler, already is easing pressure on its neighbor. North Korean goods already are becoming more abundant in China despite being banned by United Nations Security Council resolutions. And that was before the Chinese Foreign Ministry suggested easing the pressure on North Korea yesterday. Just as sanctions play an integral role in encouraging North Korea to meaningful, meaningfully engage in the negotiating table, they have similarly played a critical role in encouraging the regime to confront the human rights situation within its borders. After the 2014 Commission of Inquiry report was published, North Korea's foreign minister addressed the UN General Assembly for the first time in 15 years and offered to hold a human rights dialogue with countries not hostile to it. Now, we can't forget that North Korea quickly backtracked. After the UN General Assembly referred the Commission's findings to the Security Council in December of 2014, North Korea refused to cooperate further. But progress on this and every other issue with North Korea is measured in inches, not miles. And third, focus on the threat at hand, but not at the expense of human rights. North Korea's nuclear warheads and other dangerous weapons and their delivery systems are threats that require immediate action. But we cannot forget the unacceptable human rights situation facing the North Korean people. Kim Jong-un's growing ability to hold the U.S. homeland at risk is, after all, the driving factor in the escalating crisis. But the suffering of the North Korean people is inextricably linked to North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile program. And fourth, build American diplomatic capability and infrastructure. Diplomacy is a team sport. And no matter what commitments leaders make, it is only through a well-staffed and resourced professional diplomatic corps that it becomes a reality. The State Department must have the resources it needs to conduct foreign policy, which should include a robust discussion of the need to alleviate the suffering of the North Korean people. And finally, come to Congress. To achieve a lasting solution to the crisis, the Trump administration must work with Congress to shape the contours of any future deal. And any final agreement should take the form of a treaty to be ratified by the United States Senate so as to increase its shelf life. And should talks collapse, we must impress upon the administration that a preventative attack will not be justified. There may be a military option, but there is no military solution to the North Korean nuclear threat. It would become catastrophic very quickly if a war ever broke out on the Korean Peninsula. So we need to avoid that outcome at all costs. 
We should be ready with additional measures to further increase economic pressure on the Kim regime should there fail to be meaningful progress. After all, we have an obligation to American families, to our allies, and to the region to say unequivocally that we did everything in our power to curb North Korea's dangerous behavior without resorting to conflict. So again, we thank um, NED for everything which it does on a daily basis. I congratulate all of the honorees for their well-deserved um, uh, rewards for their work in the past in anticipation of all of the great work you now are going to do in the future. Uh, and it has been my great honor to be here and to be here once again with my great friend Andy Card. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, Senator Markey, for uh, laying out all the very difficult challenges that lie ahead. Um, we're running a little bit late, uh, but we have time. Uh, maybe we'll adjust the schedule accordingly. I now want to call upon the, the uh, members of the first panel to, uh, to take the chairs up here. Uh, Roberta Cohen, um, Jung Park, Mike Green, and uh, Ambassador Mark Lippert, uh, come on up and uh, we'll get started. I want to note that Ambassador Lippert may have to leave a little bit early. He told us that. He'll go first. Uh, and also, I want to note that Roberta Cohen is the former co-chair of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Um, I serve on the board of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, and it's the leading U.S. organization promoting human rights in North Korea. Roberta, come on up. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. So. I don't. How are you? A post summit. Good morning to everyone, and a big thank you to the National Endowment for Democracy uh, for bringing us this event. Carl Gershman, uh, the indomitable president, and uh, also I'd like to thank Lynn Lee for all the organization. Um, as Carl mentioned. Uh, I'm now the co-chair emeritus, actually, of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. And the human rights and democracy world, as you know, has long favored the integration of human rights concerns with the quest for peace. Uh, the nature of the regime in North Korea is as much a problem as nuclear weapons. Indeed, the argument has frequently been made that genuine peace and security cannot be assured without change in the human rights situation. Only time will tell whether the president's raising of human rights issues at the summit, he said he did, whether there was any real specificity to it, or concrete requests. And it's unclear whether the Trump administration will remain committed to addressing the issue in future negotiations, especially in normalization of relations with North Korea. The joint statement speaks of people's desire for peace and prosperity, but does not mention the third pillar, freedom. I look forward to a joint statement of commitment to principles of human rights. The title of today's event at NED is Connection with the People of North Korea Who Live <laughs> Under the Kim Jong-un Regime. We must recognize that the nature of the regime has strong bearing on many of the issues that will be spoken about today. Denuclearization, the question of trustworthiness, verification, access, security issues, the moral dilemma of protecting the Kim regime, normalization of relations, how US law, as Senator Markey mentioned, lifts sanctions only when human rights improvements can be made, 
economic aid, requiring access, standards, rule of law, movement of people, information and ideas. This raises the question of internet access, of safe travel for Americans. Humanitarian aid speaks to access to the most vulnerable without diversions and monitoring. The nature of the regime will have impact on the resolution of all of these issues. The U.S. cannot really have a normal relationship with a country with practices like North Korea. We have a star-studded expert panel today to discuss the North, Korea human, uh, North Korean situation. And because Do Ambassador Lippert has to leave at an early time, I'm going to call on him first uh, to look at the question of prosperity. Uh, Ambassador Lippert, I think, is well known to everyone. He was a uh, very well-liked U.S. ambassador to South Korea during the Obama administration, and he uh, served as chief of staff to the Secretary of Defense, as assistant secretary of defense for Asian and Pacific security affairs, and chief of staff at the NSC. He's president, the vice president of Boeing International. Mark, a, a few questions for you about what prosperity will mean for North Korea. To what extent does Kim Jong-un see his future survival and legitimacy becoming dependent on pulling his people out of poverty, food, medical, and medical insecurity, and delivering on economic development? President Trump has spoken of South Korean, Chinese, and Japanese economic support as if that will help set military development aside. What are the challenges for foreign economic involvement, given the nature of North Korea's economic system, treatment of workers, corruption in the markets, absence of the rule of law? What changes will be needed to make this successful? Will Kim Jong-un consider such changes a threat to his survival? Well, thanks uh, for the question, and thanks for allowing me to go first. Uh, I just have to run a little bit early, and apologies for that. It, it really is uh, a great honor to be here. Um, fantastic speech by Senator Markey to, to kick it off, and of course, uh, Mr. Card, as always, uh, well done on the introduction. I'm, I'm not from Boston, but my wife is from Vermont, so we, uh, <laughs> we consider that uh, proximate and sort of the flatlander state as well. But um, in all seriousness, um, you know, I got my start on uh, in Washington working for Senator Leahy on Capitol Hill, where we obviously work hard to fund uh, NED and you know engage on human rights issues, so this is a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, on the economic front, what I would say is a couple of things. First, there is no doubt that Kim Jong-un is focused on, on a, a range of economic issues. You look at the speech uh, he gave this year, basically his State of the Union speech, there's a strong economic focus on that. But even before uh, his speech this year, which a lot of analysts point to, um, there was, uh, I, I would say, a, a large uh, trail of, of basically indicators that the North Korean regime was increasingly interested in some kind of um, movement on the economic front, a lar largely from the defector community coming out of North Korea. There was a lot of talk uh, that the government was trying to make a turn into its economy. And the reason I say that, um, that it, it's important is not so much that I think Kim Jong-un feels um, that the country is collapsing around him like his grandfather or like his father uh, endured, but it's that I think there are two elements. One, I think he does, there's some indicators that he does want to run uh, the, ec the economy like his grandfather, top-down, state-oriented, uh, large uh, government uh, imprimatur on the economy uh, in terms of uh, in, to, to help enhance the credibility and standing of the regime. The second reason, I do think that there is a control issue. Uh, as well. And there's an excellent book by two British journalists called North Korea Confidential uh, that talks all about information flow, markets, and human rights in North Korea. And the point that they make is that after the breakdown of the public distribution system in the 90s, uh, informal markets have become a coping mechanism within North Korea. And these informal markets are 
changing the way North Korean society works and changing government control over the country. Um, it's changing the role of women. It's I increasing, in some ways, corruption. It's undermining you know, the state's authority, uh, because now, in certain instances, you're able to essentially pay your way out of small criminal acts, so on and so forth. And I think the government knows that. Uh, and the government is bothered by this. And what I always point to is when this book was reviewed by the Chosen Ilbo in Korean, uh, the North Koreans essentially sentenced the reviewers uh, to death and absentia. And they only do that uh, when you strike a nerve, when you hit on something that is going on within the society that bothers them. So I do think the economy is incredibly important for a couple of reasons, just to restate. One, in terms of just his imprimatur, the regime standing, but also to try to clean up some of these other elements that are undermining state control, changing the way North Korean society operates, uh, and really having an impact on the entire state of North Korea. Um, in terms of uh, one of the elements of the question was, you know, how is investment in North Korea going? How, what, what is required? Um, wh what I would say is that by and large, 98% of the people you talk to who have tried to do business in North Korea, who have done business in, in North Korea, really have a miserable time. Uh, there's no rule of law, there's no recourse. Chinese investors routinely report this. There are famous cases littered about the North Korean sort of a landscape, the, the Volvo case being probably the most famous. But basically, the business environment is is terrible. And the, there are a lot of um, things that the North Koreans are going to have to do uh, to, to basically fundamentally alter this uh, state of affairs to, to make it a more attractive place for investment. So I'll, I'll end by just saying this. Um, I think that they do, they do want to figure out the economic piece. Sanctions make it harder, not easier. Uh, for the North Koreans to accumulate the hard currency that they need to help facilitate and smooth uh, a turn uh, into uh, the economy. I think it's precisely uh, why um, I agree with uh, Senator Markey's comments that we need to hold the sanctions on uh, as long as possible uh, in order to see, uh, in order to essentially extract maximum concessions because I do think the sanctions are not just related to the nuclear missile program, they're also related to control over the economy and the economic situation at writ large that I think is near and dear to the, the North Korean regime's um, standing and uh, focus. So to, cl to conclude, I would just say there, there are some models that the North Koreans are looking at. There's evidence that they're looking, obviously, at the Chinese model. There's some evidence they're poking around the Vietnamese model. There's some evidence they're poking around at the Cu Cuban model. But I think at this point, they really haven't uh, figured out where they want to go, uh, how fast they want to go, or how to do this. And the lack of technical expertise coupled with political will, and I would say trepidation, uh, really cause uh, a lot of indecision. But they do realize that markets, information flow into the, into the country, into the economy are up, and that is undermining the state. So they probably have to do something at some point. And I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to turn now to Dr. Jung Pak, who is the Korea chair at the Brookings Institution, uh, who's frequently quoted and heard on the air. Uh, she Parks from the intelligence community, uh, specialized in East Asian political and security affairs, and held senior positions at the CIA and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, Jung, let's turn to U.S. guarantees of security for the Kim regime. What does that exactly mean? Uh, what does North Korea see as the major threats to its security from other countries uh, and to the security and survival of the Kim regime. Uh, will U.S. guarantees for North Korea's security reinforce the regime's legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis its own people? Uh, how does the promotion of security for the Kim Jong-un regime reconcile <coughs> with U.S. interests and values? Do you see a dilemma here? Um, thank you, Roberta, and thank you for inviting me to this amazing event, and congratulations to the award winners. Um, what an incredible mission that you have, um, and I know that this is probably not an easy political environment uh, for your work. Um, I'm not from Boston either, but my husband is, and all my in-laws still live in Boston, so, <laughs> um, so I feel like I'm at home here. So um, 
Thank you, Roberta, for herding the cats for this panel today. Uh, you know, it, Senator Markey, in his um, fantastic speech um, this morning, uh, mentioned the that our def the U.S. definition of denuclearization does not comport with the North Korea definition of denuclearization. And I think we can say the same thing about security guarantees and security assurances. Our definition. Uh, or at least the Trump administration's definition of what security guarantees are, I think are not the same as what the North Koreans are thinking um, in, in many ways. Uh, not, not, not totally true across the board, but I'll, I'll explain. Um, Senator, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo has talked about how we can uh, guarantee their security uh, and that we can convince the North Koreans that security, that they can have security only without nuclear weapons. That they're uh, future um, does not depend on nuclear weapons. So what would replace those nuclear weapons? The Trump administration has been talking about economic development, um, and, that's to, um, and that's to play off the leverage that the administration perceives on, as Mark Lippert mentioned, on this desire to develop the economy. But their desire to develop the economy and our thoughts about what developing the economy are completely different. Um, the Secretary of State has talked about a strong, connected, prosperous uh, North Korea that is integrated into the community of nations. Um, the strange four-minute video that the President showed, the, showed Kim Jong-un uh, conveyed similar things. Um, the, uh, the tech industry, um, agriculture development, um, you know, consumer, uh, consumerism and manufacturing uh, and the service industries, all of those seem like very, um, very nice things. It's, a, it's something that you, it's the type of video that you would provide for a, um, a real estate developer or a, or a foreign business that is, that wants to, that you're trying to get to invest in your company. Um, but for North Korea, it's, offensive from my perspective. Um, it's the, uh, from North Korea's perspective, I think it would be seen as offensive and as threatening. In that same video, it's, uh, it points to the two choices that Kim Jong-un has. You can have this amazing prosperity with white horses um, uh, galloping through the beaches of Wonsan, or um, this tech industry, or healthy babies and uh, uh, prosperous farmers. Um, there's that choice, but the other choice is, as the film in the, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the video starts to crackle and burn, is destruction. So you have this connected, wonderful um, video, prosperous country versus destruction. Um, but the definition, the definition that the administration is going for in this prosperity integration is exactly what North Korea does not want. They don't want integration. They don't want American imperialists and capitalists running around their country. They don't even want the Chinese imperial, you know, the Chinese running around, the Chinese businesses running around in their country. Um, tr President Trump continues to advance the idea that Kim can run his country. He can, um, North Korea has brilliant potential to be an economic and financial country. So that might be attractive to other countries. But North Korea has thrived on being completely puckered up into Pyongyang, um, where everything is focused on this highly centralized, extremely um, centralized um, uh, uh, governance model in which Kim Jong-un is the supreme leader. And when Kim Jong-un is the supreme leader, that is, and when you have this cult of personality, it is, comp it is antithetical to human rights and to opening up in, in this community of nations. Um, the, for, for them, for the North Koreans, the nuclear weapons provide that security. It's not American entrepreneurs going in. The nuclear weapons uh, provide that, nucle that security for, for the regime um, because no one else matters. Um, the supreme leader, uh, the existence of the supreme leader ma makes it so that equality and human rights and freedom of expression and individuality, the power to protest, power of assembly, um, do not apply. Um, and it doesn't apply because, it, it, and it doesn't apply in, its, in, uh, in, in this culture of repression because uh, repression and violating others' human rights are rewarded by the regime. 
um, from the local neighborhood level to the national level where the where you have informers within your family within your in your apartment building within your neighborhood um, all the way up to the national level with the various ministry the overlapping ministries that are in charge of making sure that no one steps out of line um, so when we so when we look at this model of self preservation the supreme leader concept um, where loyalty to the supreme leader is uh, rewarded with privileges you create an overlapping um, a complicated network that is that cr that makes Kim Jong Un the hub of the spokes of everybody everybody else so when we are, so and and I think one of the things that um, raises uncomfortable questions is, yes, it's true that you can't talk about nuclear weapons with anybody else other than Kim Jong-un. But then if you're talking just with Kim Jong-un and advancing this personalist politics, I think what happens is that, um, o that, um, that you start to reinforce that personalist politics in the supreme leader concept. Um, and what I find, um, unfortunate um, and concerning is the divorcing of human rights and divorcing of those pr uh, uh, of that governance model um, from the nuclear threat because I think they're inextric inextricably linked um, and that we can't have one without the other. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, our last but not least by any means speaker is Michael Green, Dr. Michael Green who's the Senior Vice President for Asia and the Japan Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. He's also Director of Asian Studies at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and served on the NSC staff of President Bush as a Senior Director for Asian Affairs and a Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, um, and there's more. Um, Mike, uh, let me start out by giving you a quote from Andrei Sakharov, Soviet's, former Soviet scientist, who said that international trust, mutual understanding, disarmament, and international security are inconceivable without an open society with freedom of information, freedom of conscience, the right to publish, and the right to travel, and choose the country in which one wishes to live. How might that apply to North Korea? Is the Kim regime capable of the transformation needed to achieve genuine denuclearization? Can one expect sufficient transparency, verification, and access? How should the U.S. best encourage such transformation? Should denuclearization be discussed in a broader framework in future, uh, like a Helsinki-type process? Um, uh, thank you, Roberta, and um, thank you, for Carl, for including me in the important work uh, that Ned does, and, and congratulations to the awardees. And I have no Boston connection, but I worked in the White House for five years <coughs> um, when Secretary Carter was Chief of Staff, and um, I just had a flashback. All the special assistants to the President are ushered into the Chief of Staff's very elegant office in the West Wing with the fireplace and the colonial period furniture. <coughs> and I sat down very excited, expecting Secretary Carter to give me inspirational words about service and country. But he looked at me and he said, Everybody makes mistakes. You're going to make a mistake. And he said, if you're going to eat crow, it tastes better early. So when you make your mistake, tell me. And then I came out of the room, and I asked my boss, Connie Rice, and I said, was that, does everyone get that talk, or was that just me? And she said, that was just you. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the other things Secretary Card said, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, you ought to publish these, because they're really um, outstanding and uh, really timeless um, guidelines for managing an organization, a high stress, high power, important organization efficiently. But one of the other things Secretary Card said to me, and I assume all special assistance to the president was, there's, there's never a case where you want to see the president, but if you need to see the president, you know, we'll hear you out. One of, one of those early cases for me was when uh, Kang Chol Hwan, the um, author of Aquariums of Pyongyang, um, came to Washington, and the President Bush had read his book and was very uh, moved by it. And so um, I was asked to meet Kang Chul Hwan, uh, spent several hours with him, and I came in and I said, you know, this is someone the President needs to see. So um, Kang Chul Hwan and Mike Gerson, the speechwriter who's written very elegantly and eloquently about the North Korea human rights situation, uh, and I went in to see President Bush uh, for over an hour. I, I suspect that the, sec that the Secretary's timeline for the President's Day did not include meeting for over an hour 
with us. But the president was just um, captivated by the human story Kang Chil Hwan told of being in a Yodok prison camp. But the most important thing that he said, that, that you know, Mr. Kang said to the president, which answers your question, um, was, um, you know, Mr. President, everyone's thinking, uh, how do we get North Korea to give up the nuclear weapons? Will a security guarantee work from the U.S. because they're afraid of uh, the U.S. Air Force? Or is it they're afraid of China, which they are, or afraid of South Korea? And Kang Shil Hwan said, the reason uh, Kim Jong-il, and now Kim Jong-un, are pursuing nuclear weapons is because the greatest threat is their own people. And they need the nuclear weapons to ensure that the international community um, doesn't have the opportunity to open their society. And he, he said to the president, as long as we are narrowly focused on nuclear weapons, um, that is exactly what the North Korean regime wants because they want to threaten the U.S. and Japan and South Korea, get us fixated on that issue, giving them guarantees that we won't criticize the regime. And that's how they want to survive because their ultimate threat is their people. And President Bush um, really took that on board. And uh, we, in our talks, uh, included uh, human rights. And in, in shortly after that meeting, I was in Pyongyang with Jim Kelly for our delegation. And, and we raised human rights. And the North Korean side, Kim gae Gwan, said, you don't understand. Everyone in our system is very happy. But they noticed that we raised human rights. And when we briefed the Japanese and Koreans, when we talked to European allies, we talked about human rights. <coughs> um, and a lot of that was the discussion with Kang Chil Hwan, who had, I think, one of the most important insights about North Korea uh, of anyone. And it goes right to the, the quote you just made. Because it's not just that the North Korean system, because it's closed, makes inspections, verification difficult. It's that the whole point of the nuclear weapons is in large part to make sure they don't have to open up. And we shouldn't forget that. I, um, like everyone, want the diplomacy to work. Um, I was involved in direct talks in New York, at the UN, in Pyongyang, the six-party talks. Um, I think it is extremely unlikely, uh, extremely unlikely that we are going to convince uh, Kim Jong-un uh, to give up nuclear weapons through diplomacy. Um, I also think, and I think Senator Markey was right on point on this, it was foolish for us to threaten preventive war which the Congress wouldn't support, our allies wouldn't support, and which, if it went uh, to full escalation, uh, could kill millions. And nobody in the Pentagon or the CIA could tell the president, don't worry, it won't escalate to full war. So I look at this problem increasingly and think, there is no path to a diplomatic uh, you know, denuclearization. And there is no military path to denuclearization for some time for the foreseeable future. And so much of the discussion last few days has been, which path do we take? And I think we're stuck in the ugly middle, like a lot of the intractable problems in foreign policy. So if you think of it that way, um, uh, and we sh probably should, it, 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 it will make you think differently about how human rights fits. Because it's not then a question of jettisoning human rights because we have to to get a nuclear deal, because there is no nuclear deal. It's how do you manage this, reduce the risk, and make progress on issues you care about. The joint statement that came out of Pyongyang um, was um, much, much thinner uh, on specifics than the 1992 commitment North Korea made to South Korea and the denuclearization accord. And it was good that Senator Markey read that out because it really contrasts with where we are now. And it was much thinner than what the Clinton administration got in the agreed framework. And it was much thinner than what we got in the six-party talk joint statement. Um, you know, if you could give the president a do-over, um, I, I would suggest he look at uh, Nixon and Mao. And people are saying this is, I mean, the president's supporters are saying this is like Nixon's opening to Mao. It's not for a lot of historical reasons. But there are nevertheless um, important lessons. W when Nixon and Mao issued their statement, um, uh, there was a long section that Mao put forward about how Pyongyang, Hanoi, uh, Beijing and world communism would dominate, and we would all end up on the hash, hash, hash heap of history. And then President Nixon had a long statement about how we stand by our democratic values, market, free market capitalism, our allies, that Japan, South Korea, Taiwan are, 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 are the systems that work. I mean, it was uh, out there. It was very clear what we stood for. And then the last paragraph in the joint statement said, and the two leaders look forward to working towards normalization. And uh, that is what President Trump should have done in this joint statement. He should have put out a statement of what we stand for, 
um, let Kim Jong-un put out a statement of what they stand for, and then in the joint statement say, we'll work on uh, the, the tough uh, move towards denuclearization. That's, if he could do, get a mulligan, that's what he should have done. Um, maybe now, I I if we configure the talks going forward, we can somehow do that. Um, maybe if we have a larger framework, I think Congress needs to be involved because um, a peace treaty ending the Korean War formally or normalization both require Senate ratification. They ought to be involved early. I think congressional instincts from what Senator Markey has said, from what Cory Gardner, Dan Sullivan, and others have <laughs> said are good on this. Um, and maybe we can reconfigure this in the next stages to, to, to get at um, these issues, which we should because this is not a case where we have to sacrifice human rights or our allies to get a denuclearization deal because there, there ain't one. <laughs> this is going to be a, a long, hard process, and we ought to set it up and realize that. Thank you very sure. much. Um, Mark, before you uh, have to go, I wonder if I could ask you a question or two that I'm going to put to the whole panel, uh, but that you can go first in responding to. Uh, one, I wanted to see uh, whether you thought that the U.S., and some of you have already answered this in some, in some different ways, um, whether you thought the United States uh, compromised its own agenda or gained ground uh, in Singapore. Uh, was this a successful summit as you see it? Um, and then a second question, how best can the Trump administration in the United States connect to the people of North Korea and try to promote change in the country without violating the spirit of the joint statement? Well, great questions. Um, and you know, really terrific remarks by uh, John and Mike uh, to uh, really, I think, uh, put uh, or at least underscore some of the, the, the most poignant elements that came out of the summit. I mean, what I would say on, on, on the summit is, first, uh, I agree with, with those who said the, the joint statement is just very thin. I, I didn't watch any of the punditry. I went to bed. I was, Mike knows uh, that <laughs> I love playing with uh, my dog, so I was hanging out with my basset hound <laughs> instead of watching TV. <laughs> Woke up the next day um, and uh, said, I sort of read through the joint statement and I said, well, I just, there's got to be more here. And so one, it was thin. And then the more was the statements around the U.S. troop presence, the, the statements about Guam and the strategic bombers, the statements about exercises, the states about, uh, the statements about pulling <coughs> the troops out, um, really all for almost no real give in return from the North Koreans. I would actually say probably no, no give in return from the North Koreans. So I don't think, at least in round one, uh, the U.S. moved the ball forward on its interests uh, at all. Your mic's uh, off. Sorry, I can't. Sorry, sorry. I was getting my mic's off. Plays from the first big coach. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Apologize. Um, maybe that was intentional. Anyway, um, the. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I don't, I don't think in round one that the, um, that the ball was moved forward by the administration uh, on advancing U.S. interests. But l let me just play a little bit of devil's advocate on the other side that, you know, I, I was sort of thinking this through in terms of how would you argue from an analytic point of view that there are um, elements that are really positive out of the summit. And so let me try to make that argument quickly, which is first, what the administration has done by essentially agreeing to the joint statement plus the statements the president made about U.S. troop contributions is, by and large, um, align itself with longstanding views from the South Korean left, the Chinese, and to some extent the American left about creating the conditions for peace. Uh, and, you know, this longstanding argument, which I don't believe, especially in the case of Kim Jong un, goes a little something like we have to basically create the environment in, in a more peaceful, a more amicable environment, the North Koreans will come out and they will negotiate. And we will now get to test that theory, right? We will, we will align ourselves with those who have, 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 have <coughs> held the view for a long time and we'll get to test that theory. And if the North Koreans walk away, you know, you could make an argument that you have now tried really every last thing and perhaps could go back to sanctions or and or some other uh, process. Second, the point that I would say is it's early, right? It dovetails with point one, right? That, okay, we're the great power. We made some concessions early. And um, uh, let's see what happens round two, round three, round four. Those will be the dispositive rounds. And finally, uh, you can argue that you have started 
uh, a potentially paradigm shifting conversation between the leaders and at extremely high levels. And, you know, I mean, I think people who worked in the White House and people who worked uh, in, in cabinet offices here know that, you know, for all of the difficult issues that are out there and for all of the really serious impediments, there is always a chance when you get leaders into a room that the dynamic could change uh, and the paradigm can change. And there is nothing like getting leaders together. So those are sort of my three best arguments for why there, there could be success down the road out of this summit. I don't happen to subscribe to them, but I do think that they are worth at least considering. And I think the other thing, though, you have to ask yourself if you're a skeptic is, were these three elements worth paying a pretty high price in terms of a summit, a pretty high price in terms of comments about U.S. troop levels, and a pretty high, pr high price in terms of a very thinly worded statement on that? Uh, quickly on, um, you know, what, what can we do in terms of to connect uh, with the North Korean people? Uh, I, I just come back to my, my first uh, comments. Uh, and I, I do believe, and I don't think the Obama administration did enough on this. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I'm a big believer in information flow and uh, market, these markets that you talk about, and to a lesser extent, really emphasizing the human rights. I, I think that the human rights uh, debate is an important one, and a, but it stands a little bit apart from the other two elements uh, in terms of, uh, I think, its impact internally on the regime, at least in terms of its immediacy. I think it's incredibly important and one that we absolutely have to fight for, and I don't want to back away from it at all. And I actually am proud of the Obama administration record on human rights in terms of multi ingraining it in the multilateral fi fiber, opening the UN office in Seoul, getting other NGOs out in Seoul, and I, I, I really am proud of that. But I do think for to connect directly with the North Korean human people in the very near term, I think figuring out smart, effective policies, both from the United States and our allies, and to a lesser extent, the Chinese, how do we get market the market activity to increase? How do we get more information flow into North Korea? Because I do think that those have had a profound effect uh, on the North Korean society and economy. And the one anecdotal example I always use is, you know, around 2000, I think it was, the North Koreans finally dropped the uh, propaganda point that you know Pyongyang was more developed in Seoul because they just realized it wasn't uh, sustainable among its people. So there are a whole litany of examples where the North Koreans have made adjustments. I think they, under, they realize that information is coming in, and that information is not always favorable to the regime. So anything we can do in those two areas especially, I think, really do have the potential for a profound impact over time. Appreciate very much you being on. Can I can I add some oh, of the I, I some of the good would. things um, so to to add to the um, Mark's list of things that good things that might have happened? Um, I think um, I think Kim has to be very careful about hubris about um, in the in the state media after the Singapore uh, meeting when Kim was strolling through the streets of Singapore, bright lights, beautiful you know um, buildings, um, stores, um, all the consumer trappings of luxury. Um, that was plastered all over the state media the day after. Um, he has elevated his wife as this fashion icon. Um, so what he's doing there, and I think what engagement does, is that it gives him opportunities to, um, to showcase this. Um, so there are, crit there are criticisms about that, right? Um, but the other side of it is that it, you know, he might be flying too close to the sun in raising expectations about what he can offer to the North Koreans. Um, yes, his, his wife is beautifully dressed and she's, she's wearing the best, you know, she, she carries the best bags. Um, he's strolling through Singapore, all these beautiful things that maybe it's a way to show what the, you know, that not, that, not just that Kim is being um, touted and feted in this way, but also that this, is, this could also be Pyongyang at some point. Um, the danger of the rising expectations of a consumerist society, an increasingly consumerist society, uh, contrasting that with um, the the uh, crushing weight of sanctions that could um, uh, that could um, undermine all of that. So I think there's that um, aspect of what to, to add what to what Mark was saying. Um, but I'd also say that there's the opportunity cost of having uh, of having this type of summit that brought so little. Um, and the opportunity cost are that Kim might be Kim will be a different person after the summit. 
um, in that he might be more emboldened. He might think that he can start pushing the U.S. around even more um, and that he can start pushing the South Koreans around and that, he fe that, that, his, uh, that his confidence will lead him to be much bolder or um, more um, stubborn on, on various issues. So that's one of the opportunity costs. The second is that if, if there is any um, element of um, criticism within Pyongyang about the way, North, w the way Kim has been um, conducting foreign affairs or domestic politics, if they were there, if those small voices were there, they will no longer be there, right? Because Kim's stat lifting of his status with the U.S. president and in the international community, the lifting of sanctions, whether we like it or not, maximum pressure is dead, um, is that Kim was right. We should listen to this 34-year-old. We should be listening to him in the future. So combine um, Kim's increased confidence with the fact that whatever voices there might have been that might have constrained him, um, you create this person where you um, strengthen the supreme leader in that way. So I think, so I want to complicate that in terms of you know, what's good, what might be good, and what might come out of the summit, but also the opportunity costs of, of, and the unintended consequences of the summit. Um, when um, the North Korean people see splices of what um, happened at the summit, uh, they may see pictures of um, President Trump speaking about how honorable and how honored he is to meet with Kim Jong-un. Um, and um, they may also hear that he has learned how much Kim Jong-un loves his people. Um, what kind of impact do you think that is felt in North Korea by any of those who see that on, on the air? I wonder what that conveys. But let me come back to Mike, too, about the summit, well, how you find it. Um, and are there positives? Are there um, negatives and concerns? Uh, does the work all begin now? Uh, and uh, what does that exactly mean? And how do we reach the North Korean people then? So I'm, I'm tempted, this cynic in me is tempted, and so I will say, <laughs> I mean, um, he's going to now embark, Kim Jong-un is now going to embark on a series of foreign trips that are well publicized in advance. So this significantly increases the chance of a coup d'etat. Here's a positive outcome for the cynics. <laughs> um, I'm being a little facetious. That's not necessarily positive, by the way, because <laughs> I, just, to, just to parenthetically note, chaos in North Korea is not good. <laughs> um, uh, nuclear weapons, chemical and biological weapons, a million men under arms, um, and a criminal syndicate network. That's, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm being a little facetious, just to be clear. Um, instability in the North is re regime change, meaning this regime is gone, is something that is, is I think, um, desirable for anyone who cares about freedom. But the transition is extremely uh, dangerous, just to make that side point. Um, you know, the positive spin you could put on this is um, that Kim Jong-un uh, clearly enjoyed being on the world stage. He's going to continue enjoying it. Um, and so I think at the margins, there's a prospect that um, uh, he will not test missiles or nuclear weapons for a while. I wouldn't read too much into that because it's, it's easily reversible, and any missile development program has its pauses for technical reasons. So we shouldn't read too much into it. But I do think he's now incentivized, in part because he's enjoying and reaping so much benefit from being on the world stage, uh, to um, behave with respect to missiles and nuclear weapons. <coughs> um, maybe in other categories as well. Maybe um, uh, with respect to his uh, illicit and criminal activities. Uh, maybe even. Uh, with respect to how he treats his people. Um, the president was asked about this, as you saw, and said, you know, the, the, the people in the Yodok camps are the big winners. Well, he can follow up on that. He can make sure it's an issue um, if, if he meant that. So, but that's at the margins. Um, I don't think uh, w there's much more uh, we're going to get than uh, some improvement at the margins. But that may have been worth it. Um, except for, I mean, we're talking mostly about North Korea, prestige, uh, the regime, whether or not we're going to get leverage in negotiations, all problematic. But another um, narrative came out of this summit that was not part of the NSC staff, State Department, Pentagon planning, but that the president introduced. Um, and it's, 
it's disturbing, and it's on a different chessboard. It's not the chessboard with North Korea about nuclear weapons and human rights. It's on the chessboard uh, about the future of geopolitics in Asia and the influence of China and the uh, durability and influence of our alliances with democratic partners. And on that chessboard, that second geopolitical chessboard, the president just handed um, Beijing and Moscow um, his, 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 his knight and rook. <laughs> he just handed them over um, for nothing because s unilaterally declaring that we will stop military exercises with our, with our allies, and I can tell you with certainty the allies did not see that coming, um, says to the allies and to China, Russia, North Korea, that the president's willing to, to do this, to, to say things about fundamental security of our alliances and our security commitments without consulting with them. So that uh, it, 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 it is, is deeply unnerving. The Australian Foreign Minister, Julia Bishop, who's a great friend of the United States, um, said, well, it wasn't in the joint statement, so we're basically not going to treat it as policy. And I think she's throwing the ball back to Mattis and Pompeo to, to put that one back um, and hoping that it was inaudible. But she also made the point, allies can decide what they need to do in terms of exercises for their security. So that, that precedent was not good. And then when the president threw out this um, audible about how he'd like to bring troops home, that is not the future uh, you project when you're in the beginning of a negotiation where you have very little leverage and where you have this other chess game where the Chinese goal is to get us out of Asia. So, you know, you should all, if you're interested in this larger geopolitical piece, look at a article in today's Washington Post, an op-ed by um, uh, Bilahari Kosakan, who's uh, a Singaporean diplomat, retired now, very thoughtful. And the Singaporeans measure these geopolitical things very, they don't care about human rights very much, but they measure the geopolitics very carefully. And he said, this is as significant as Nixon's opening to Mao, because this could lead us down the path where America retrenches and replaces uh, our leading role with a multipolarity in Asia, where uh, not only the US, China, uh, Russia, North Korea, but now Japan, South Korea have nuclear weapons, and that this means everyone checkmates each other so the U.S. can retrench, and maybe that's more stable. And he thinks that's what President Trump is trying to do because, of course, the president said things like that in the campaign trail. I doubt that's what Secretary Mattis or others are planning, but that narrative is now out there, and it's not good for us or our allies, and I think we need to keep an eye on that because that, that one has to get under control <laughs> um, or will have problems far beyond the North Korea problem. Um, I'd like to turn to the audience uh, for questions. And I just want to say one thing, though, with regard to the human rights element that's come up. Um, and you mentioned U.S. retrenchment. Uh, human rights is not just the United States telling uh, the North Koreans that you are violating this or you are doing this, and you take a weapon and you bang them over the head with it. That, that is not, uh, human rights is what the United States stands for. The panel has made the point that who we are, what we stand for, needs to be conveyed uh, in a discussions with North Korea. Uh, it isn't something that should be hidden away. It's our history and it's our ideas. Um, human rights also encompasses a very broad range of issues. Uh, that includes freedom of information, uh, and that includes expression and religion, that includes um, freedom from arbitrary arrest and imprisonment. It's a, it's a very broad uh, base, uh, brush that also includes economic rights and the right to food and uh, the right to a decent standard of living that a government should uh, help to try to uh, gain for its population. Um, so when we think about human rights, let's not think of it in the narrowest way of shall we raise it. It's there. It encompasses all these issues in every way. Uh, it's very much part of the United States and what it is. So it can't just be put off in a corner. Um, and that, I think, is how we should begin to recognize this. But let us go to questions in the audience. I did see some hands up before I began. Yes. Could you stand up and um, uh, just mention who you are? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, OK. You can answer this. 
So uh, Chris Walker at the net, I just wanted to first thank the speakers for really a terrific discussion and, and ask for their thoughts on this notion that um, markets and economic development will necessarily lead to the sort of uh, openings and salutary developments because some of the other countries that have been alluded to, China, Vietnam, Cuba, their regimes have proven to be very adept at using economic opening to refresh their control in a sense. And so what should we keep in mind as we think through this notion of using markets and economic space as necessarily a way to get uh, even slow political liberalization of the sort that uh, reasonable people would wish to see in North Korea? Uh, Jung, would you like to yes. comment on that? Because Thank you. Jung yeah. has to leave shortly. Uh, that's the McDonald's theory of foreign relations. Um, where you know if you have if the assumption is that if they're open to Western ideas that somehow we're all going to get along um, and hold hands, um, but I think that um, I think when we when we're looking at North Korea we have to be careful about mirror imaging, um, and I think the president is to a great extent mirror imaging North Korea and that he's looking at Kim as a businessman who wants acclaim and who wants wealth. Um, the president keeps mentioning wealth and prosperity, financial nation, um, you know, in Kim being part of this great empire. Um, so I think, you know, on the mirror imaging, we have to care be careful that, you know, Kim has other drivers than wealth. He has wealth. Uh, and that um, that there that but that North Korea, for, but for Kim, um, the nuclear weapons are a part of his identity, or is part of his national identity. It's in the Constitution. It's on the stamps. It's in their textbooks. It's on the murals. Um, and I think that um, you know when we're talking about the the carrots that we're offering, that we have to keep that in mind. Um, so you know, you know, there's some one of the theories. Um, um, Bill Brown advances this is that th that sanctions. Um, and the continual erosion of the state's a ability to support itself and support its people um, creates, um, uh, it strengthens the markets, the people, the entrepreneurs, the woman who's selling dumplings on the streets or somebody who's renting out their apartment um, or their room for, you know, uh, for you know, love affairs or what, whatever it is that people are doing or engaging in these activities, um, and that the the greater um, that their uh, that of their reliance on the state um, and the uh, increase in corruption and in, in taking people's hard earned money um, away from them, um, and uh, that that will create this combustible mix of people who are not who are going to be very disappointed or uh, protest against um, Kim Jong-un this happened in 2009 with the currency reform um, it was the first time you know one of the few times that we had seen that um, Kim probably learned a lesson from 2009 and that you should not mess with people's currency um, and that uh, you know so, so that is something that um, probably lies deep in Kim's mind about he, you know, he has to kind of let the markets flourish, but he also has to make sure to maintain that balance of control. Can I <coughs> briefly uh, uh, touch on that also? The, um, I just wanted to, in case, Joan. Oh, yeah. Um, but you have to go. Sorry. Sorry. Go you're, you're solo. But, right. but, <laughs> out. but I wanted to thank you. Thank you. I, I meant to also thank Mark Lippert uh, with all of you and uh, Mike also because it's been a very knowledgeable, well-informed, sobering, uh, and... Um, an excellent, excellent panel uh, on these issues, and very well, very principled too. Um, I thought I was going to be the human rights person on the panel. I mean, and and try to interject that, but I didn't need to because of the the three of you, how you've been. So thank you very much. And then we'll take another question. We'll hear a comment from my queen, and then we'll close. Thank you. <coughs> um, well, I thought Jung's earlier uh, point about the necessity of Kim Jong Un and the Kim dynasty in general, being at the center of this network uh, was really important. Um, the problem for the North Korean system with introducing real uh, market economics is that uh, market economics are based on competition um, and um, the Kim family can't survive, probably, um, a situation where people have choices of where they receive their um, food, their money, and their uh, information. Um, the North Korean 
leader now talks about Pyongyang, this economic uh, modernization to catch up with nuclear weapons. Uh, I strongly suspect, I haven't seen any evidence to the contrary, that what that means is um, the North Koreans need enough so that they can retain, remain, uh, sort of set up a Potemkin village-like uh, you know, set of Starbucks or McDonald's or, or theme parks for the elite, um, and then cash. And the cash, as with the Kaesong industrial project the South Koreans set up, or Mount Kumgang, or our efforts, uh, which were suspended to recover our uh, POW MIA, all of that was um, the North Korean demand uh, for us helping them was that we provide cash. And cash went all into the regime, and then they supplement that, of course, with uh, illicit and illegal activities, uh, counterfeiting uh, drugs, uh, the, the prescription drugs, selling illegal drugs, and the rest. <coughs> um, uh, they need to open that aperture um, to m maintain cash flow for the um, leadership, to maintain control of the elite and the Korean People's Army, which means nuclear weapons and missiles for them. The vast majority of North Koreans at subs subsistence or starvation level I think serves the regime in terms of preventing uh, rebellion. Um, rebellions don't happen generally when people are afraid of being turned into the secret police or starving. They happen when people start getting choices. And um, so what, uh, what Kim needs uh, in terms of quote unquote economic opening is fairly limited. Um, and uh, the tough dilemma for us is I think, you know, looking forward to unification, we're going to want North Koreans who understand market principles. Uh, but then how do we, you know, train or help those people, develop those people without creating um, uh, an army of um, cyber warriors, uh, which I think is what is happening at the Pyongyang University of Technology that was set up, or uh, people who know how to manipulate bank accounts and Bitcoin um, to get cash for the regime. That's our dilemma. Maybe we should take some risk to train those kinds of people and encourage that, but, but it, uh, it's not... This is not a sort of turn on the market economic switch and all of a sudden we have change. Thank you. Um, is there a burning question? Because we have to close, but I do see a, a hand over there. Let's do that as the last question. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks for giving me this chance. I'm So Young Kim from Radio Frasia. I have a quick question. So like, um, Dr. Green said, and other critics said, like, the joint statement looks really thin and broad, and it seems like there's not much come out from this summit. So what's going to happen next between uh, U.S. and North Korea? It seems there will be a um, follow-up meeting this summer anyway. So do you see there will be any progress, and they will eventually talk more details about denuclearization and other stuff? Thank you. Um, well... Um, I, th th the best case scenario I can think of is that maybe Secretary Pompeo, who is a very capable guy, and there have been press reports that the administration doesn't have technical experts, and that's not true. They have very good technical experts. Uh, so the best case scenario is Secretary P Pompeo sits down with his counterpart to be determined, by the way. We don't know who that is. And, um, and Kim Jong-un is enjoying this enough um, that he gives something uh, more concrete than we saw in the joint statement. Um, a lot of us who've been in these negotiations say the, the real test will be uh, uh, will they turn over or will they agree to a declaration? In other words, an inventory of what they have. You can't negotiate the terms of denuclearization if the other side doesn't tell you what they have. We have some idea from our intelligence, but uh, that's the first step. Confession <laughs> is the first step. Um, it doesn't mean they'll denuclearize, but they never did it in the agreed framework with Clinton. They never did it in the six-party talks with us, despite saying they would. Um, that's the best case scenario. At least it shows there's some traction. I, I would say that's a 10 or 20% chance at best. I think the more likely scenario is that Secretary Pompeo has a really hard time because he, he doesn't have the leverage he needs. The fact that we're keeping sanctions on is good and the administration's sanctions uh, announcement last September was very impressive, very strong. But North Korea does 90% of its trade with China. And as we heard uh, from Senator Markey already, the Chinese are backing off. So I think he'll have, and then the president's statement about exercises and troops, he'll have a hard time. Uh, uh, I suspect he won't get much. Maybe the North Koreans will be clever and give him a, a kind of fig leaf, uh, uh, you know, a, a blowing up a rocket testing facility they don't need or that's not critical to their program. We might see that. It's possible the president 
could say, I'm done, I'm out of here, we're going back to maximum pressure and fire and fury, I think that would be very uh, unlikely, actually. I think it would be very hard to get, a co a, you know, a coalition is hard to put together, and the administration did a good job, actually, putting together a coalition. Once you do what we just saw, it's very hard to put that coalition back together because the expectations that most of us in this room have or maybe the Japanese have, or the Korean defense establishment has, for verification, Chinese and Russians don't care about that. They will blame us. So it'll be very hard, I think, for the president to go back to uh, maximum pressure. And politically, I suspect he won't want to. Um, you know, I was in the NSC staff. I was not in the domestic side of the White House. I don't have a license to comment on domestic politics. But my, my impression is that politically for the president, this is playing pretty well. If you watch Fox News, if you listen to uh, candidates who ran with his support, and so I don't see him wanting to, um, for political reasons, uh, reverse this momentum, certainly not before the midterms. So I think we'll probably muddle along. And I suspect that somewhere down the road, this will probably end up like the agreed framework, like the six-party talks. When the North Koreans are ready again, they'll test, um, they'll, 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 they'll ask for a higher price, and we'll be back back to the same old dilemma. I, I'm afraid. I, I, you know, I, I, it's not 100% certain, but I think that's certainly the pattern. And I don't see uh, the difference this time that would break that pattern, although maybe, maybe we can, we can um, get a little bit of, 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 of traction. Maybe. We'll see. It's all to Pompeo now. And uh, they, God help him, and I hope he succeeds. There are always opportunities <coughs> when a negotiation begins. Um, but I think it's important that uh, we're all aware, and I think the panel has made us more aware of what we're dealing with. Uh, the nature of the North Korean regime, a 70-year-old enclosed dictatorship, um, trying to find some ways of opening that and beginning a road uh, towards some sort of relationship. I think that's a good place to start, and there's a lot of work that will be need to be done now um, and I think that everybody here can contribute to that work. There are going to be so many phases uh, to where we are that the kinds of issues and concerns everyone has, it's a good time to begin to make them known. Let us thank the panel in spirit and in person. <laughs> um,